Hey, I'm Caleb Anderson, and this is the Spirit Farm Podcast, where we help busy professionals, busy people to crush their goals, do their dreams without compromising their health, their relationships, or their spiritual life. In this episode, I interview John Lefebvre. This guy is one of those most interesting man in the world award winners. He has been an attorney. He has been a producer of music, dropping multiple albums. He has made hundreds of millions of dollars as a startup entrepreneur and then been a convicted criminal serving time in federal prison, Come, coming out of that experience with this awakening on how to give back, be generous, serve the greater good. It's a fascinating conversation with John. I know that you're going to love it. But first, let me make sure that you are aware we have just launched a new coaching pro program. It's not too late to jump in. It's called Renew Your Mind. It's an eight-week journey to overcome fear, anxiety, overwhelm, burnout, frustration, and set you back on the path of inner peace, connection to your creator without losing your performance edge. And I want to talk to you about it personally to see if it's a good fit for you. You can schedule a free 30 to 45-minute coaching call with me at spiritfarm.live forward slash apply. One more time, spiritfarm.live forward slash apply. The call is totally free. We'll talk about where you're at, where you want to be, what's preventing you from getting there. And we will decide whether the coaching package is a good fit for you in this season. So book a call with me in the next 48 hours. I look forward to hearing from you. And without further ado, let me introduce you to John. His website is johnlefebvre.com. Here's John. John, thank you for joining the Spirit Farm podcast today. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, Caleb. I'm I'm really knocked out for an opportunity to be in a in a you know in a theater where people are primarily considered are considering matters of spirituality and consciousness. Most of the time, people want to talk to me about like politics and governance and you know being wealthy and those sorts of things. So it's a, <laughs> it's a great treat for me to actually talk about something that matters. Absolutely, man. Well, we, we want to hear about that. And we want you to dip into uh, some of the money stuff because it's a part of your story and it's an important sure. part of your story. You should, you and uh, and I'm really excited to, to actually start with your story because you've, you're kind of like one of the characters of like the most interesting men in the world, you know, and <laughs> the, the life that you have led, the, the music that you have made. Uh, the money that you have made, and then your time in prison. So let's go. Let's go back to you. You obviously have these diverse range of skill sets and an entrepreneurial bent. How did that get cultivated? It, was that just been in you since you were a child? Did parents kind of cultivate that a little bit? Uh, what set you on your path toward like early financial and creative success? I'm the guy least likely to get rich. I'm a guy mm -hmm. who couldn't be bothered balancing his checkbook when he was a kid. I had dreams oh. of, you know, the dreams you had when you were a kid, you wake up in the night and you find a whole bag of gold and then you put it under your pillow and you wake up in the morning, it's not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I woke up and it was there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy, you know, I, 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 so anyways, I, I admired, you know, by the time I got to university, I was around 28 and I, um, I really admired, you know, I, I owned a taxi cab, you know, I was a, like a construction laborer in downtown Calgary, working with the Italians was wonderful. Um, but the, um, but um, I ran into a bunch of people who were, you know, five or six years younger than me, and they were very, very devoted to, to, to their professional careers on the one side. And yeah. also, I was very fortunate to run into some people who were not only extremely devoted to developing them, developing themselves professionally, but in their leisure, they were ridiculously random. And so that was a, that, that was a, 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 um, a yin and yang that I really, really yeah. loved. And so yeah. those guys, you know, I was older when I started to gain an appreciation for looking after myself financially. Okay. So, but and so my, it was, you were exposed to people that were just kind of dabbling in a bunch of different things. And that, that kind of, that kind of drew out your curiosity. Well, I met lots of people, you know, that were doing those sorts of things when I was growing up. You know, my best friend, Fred, for a while was a, ran a gardening thing. So I did, you know, work for him as a gardener and watched what it was like for him to be a businessman and that sort of thing. But um, by the time I got, by the time I met these people that I was saying influenced me that way, we were in university and they were just preparing themselves to, to go out into the world and be big shots. And, you know, I would, I, I, I was pretty much prepared to spend the rest of my life eating their dust. But <laughs> that's not the way the chips fell, right? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but um, my mom, uh, I was raised as a Catholic as a young kid, and I was, you know, in the choir in the choir at St. Mary's Cathedral and uh, on oh. an altar boy and that sort of thing. Oh. So um, I was, uh, you know, I, I was raised by Catholic uh, priests and nuns, and they were um, wonderful, wonderful people, you know, in, in spite of their uh, the institution that they were involved with. Yeah. And they were, and and some of those. Uh, men wound up in prison, you know, for abusing young people. So that was a really good lesson on authority, you know. The, some of those, some of those men in your town, in my school, in Father school. White, yeah, wow, yeah, wow. Father, Father Father White wound up doing five years. When he's on the way out of, uh, when when he's on the way out of prison, somebody stuck a mic in front of his face and said, um, "What uh, would you have to say to uh, your Lord?" And he said, "I've made my peace with my Lord." And I looked over at my mom, and she said. You haven't made your peace with your Lord until you've made your peace with your victims. Mm. Mm. That's who I was raised by. My mom mm. taught us that Catholic, like that. that Catholic means universal, mm. universal. The book I've written is about universal rights. And mm. primarily, Caleb, it's about universal rights and the responsibilities that come with them. Those who accept the benefits of freedom, but are careless about what others less fortunate must endure have not paid the dues of their freedom. They've only taken mm. liberties. Yeah. Okay. Say say more about that. You, I will. They, ha they haven't oh, no. paid the dues of their freedom. Yeah. yeah I think They've freedom comes. We, we, we've been told since we were children that um, the, 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 there's a, the cost of freedom is very, very high. Right. They told us it was the highest cost. We go out and lose our lives for to fight for freedom. Right. I think I think the cost of freedom is much higher than that. Just, just, mm. just, just for starters, you know, if that is the cost of freedom, then well, I don't know what the math is, but you know, one in a hundred thousand of us pay that price and the rest of us get it for free. I don't mm. think so. That doesn't sound right. right. Actually. Right. And so I've thought about this a lot since I became quite, you know, wealthy. We can talk about that a little bit later too, if you want, but, yeah. um, but you know, that, that kind of wealth brought me to thinking about it. And I think I've come where I've landed is that I think the cost, the true cost of freedom is to, stri to strive every day in any, any way we can, any way that's available to each of us to, to assure that soon, someday soon, be on a track that everybody else will enjoy what you and I take for granted every day. Hmm. When, you look at, when, you, when we look at ourselves, Caleb, and try to understand, well, all these things that we take for granted in our life are, um, you know, we take for granted, uh, you know, it, for instance, integrity and security of the person. Uh, we take for granted access to food, clothing and shelter access to the tools of self-improvement, education, uh, you know, access to health, uh, access to justice and basic finance. We don't talk about those much, but we certainly take them for granted. And finally, mm -hmm. last but certainly not least, access to a healthy environment. We take all of those things for granted, but that, and as entitlements almost, not entitlements the way you guys talk about them in government, but actual entitlements. And I think we should, I think we should, we are entitled to those things. But mm. here's the problem though, when we look at those things and try to distinguish what is there about us that makes them an entitlement for us that, but they're not an entitlement for the lady in the deserts of Somalia. Mm. And uh, it's as stri strive as I might, I've not yet come up with a, a, a good enough distinction. Yeah. I think there is nothing that distinguishes. I think there are entitlements for us, and there are also equally entitlements of birthright for all human beings, the spiritual animals on the earth. And and it's our, the, the cost, okay, back to the question. The cost of freedom is to strive to share it with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that's good, John. Let, let's um I want to come back to some of that and your philosophies. Let's let's jump to the how you were the unlikely story uh of waking up and finding money under your pillow. And 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 then I, because I think that that's part of what shaped your view of life and your philosophy around generosity and and freedom and liberty. Um so sure. let's let's jump there first. You, uh, you say that you're least likely, but then you ended up making millions and millions of dollars in a, um, in a startup and kind of in a tech related startup. Take us there. I was a lawyer for about eight years when uh, a guy wandered into the office named Steve Lawrence, and he was he was a small time real estate developer in Calgary, and I helped him with the law side of his real estate de development business. One of the things he had was a car wash. And um, he, a kid, 16 years old, Jeff Natlin, worked in the car wash, stuffing soap in the machines and pulling out the coins. And uh, 
and he he said that he was gambling online last night. And Steve says, "Oh, you were? Eh? How, how'd you pay for it? Oh, it's my dad's credit card." <laughs> and so they started looking at that for a while. And, they, and what Steve realized, Caleb, was that if somebody brought um, some professionalism, reliability, responsibility to the online money transfer side of online gaming, that that would make a really, really great little business model. Hmm. And so that's what started it out. And Steve asked me if I'd like to help him husband that along a little bit because he was busy with other things. And, and I said, yeah, no, let's go for it. I, I imagined that I might get back up to net worth zero. You know, I had, I was probably <laughs> down around 50 or 60 grand by then, you know, bumming money from my mom and going to school and all the rest of that. But um, so anyways, we started this business and the, 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 uh, the market was super ripe for it. And, um, you know, within, uh, we never spent a dime on advertising, but uh, within three years, uh, we went uh, public on uh, uh, the AIM board at the London Stock Exchange and achieved a market cap of around $2 billion. And I had about 27% of that. That's so, incredible. Yeah, and that, paper, was, that was in about 2003. You, you founded yeah, it, around, it, and it was called netteller.com. Yes, netteller, yes. 2003 is when you went public and had a valuation of $2 billion. Two billion, yeah, two billion American dollars. That's right. That's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. And we, um, yeah, and we were, and, and we just, you know, sailed sailed through the clouds with it, um, and until in around uh, early two thousand seven, there was a knock on my door at one of my two houses on Malibu Beach, and it was and Malibu, S- like above Los Angeles. Yeah, Malibu, west of Los Angeles. That's right. Uh-huh. They say it's above. They, they they say it's north, but the high it's actually west. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's funny down there. But we, we yeah. say the roads go. Um, I had two places on Malibu Beach, and the cops came to the one that I was in, and said, "You must come to the door right now." We're federal marshals, and blah blah blah. So we were all arrested, and um, uh, we're charged with. They were threatening. You know, they were threatening three twenty-year offenses, uh, racketeering conspiracy and money laundering. Uh, ultimately, after about seven or eight months of negotiation, I pled guilty to a five-year offense, uh, conspiracy to promote illegal gambling. And about six years later, uh, after plea bargaining and helping, uh, you know, helping out the cops understand what was going on, um, Department of Justice, uh, I wound up um, doing 45 days in prison in Manhattan. <laughs> Only the best. For <laughs> I was in the same. I was in. I was in the same joint in Manhattan that uh, that uh, Ep- Jeffrey Epstein uh, woke up one morning and found that he had killed himself, <laughs> <laughs> or didn't wake up but found that he had killed himself. Yeah, that's right. And um, yeah. It's the same actually El Chapo is in that joint too, but it's, it's down, was it's down on Pearl Street in South South Manhattan there. I was I spent 45 days there. Wow. Uh, but look at you. Um, I forfeited $40 million. My partner Steve forfeited $60 million and our company forfeited $140 million. So we wow. we forfeit we forfeited a quarter of a billion dollars. And at that time, uh, you know, um United States was still kind of embroiled in in Iraq. And uh, I think they were spending about two and a half billion dollars a week, they were saying. So I calculated that our quarter of a billion dollars took them to around coffee time Monday. <laughs> <laughs> around coffee time Monday. Oh man. So, so, all right, let's back up a little bit because um, that's, that's a lot of action. First of all, just the entrepreneurial journey of starting something like that, uh, not having high expectations, thinking you're just gonna get back up to net zero and and then you have hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of this uh, that's yours that's that is your chunk of this pot and um, what 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 changed about your thinking uh, when that began to occur when this thing begins to take off and you realize did you realize hey I am I'm I'm good at something I'm I'm I have a more I have an aptitude that, for this that I didn't think that I had, were you working crazy hours and just barely trying to keep up? Or did it feel like this was just kind of like your groove, like this just kind of happened to you and you were in the right place at the right time? Take us through your your journey with that and what you were feeling. Well, from, from the time Steve came to us with the idea until uh, we went public, which is only about three years, um, I was working uh, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I was there all the time. Like all the time, I was I was the telephone service 
um, you know, I ran, I ran the customer service side of the business. Okay. And geez, every time we call you, I get you, John, I'm a pretty lucky guy. You know, yeah, yeah, no, it's just, it's a, it's a funny thing, you know, it's, it's a, a funny it's coincidence. A, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, 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 and we went off out on, you know, we, we go off on journeys to find bankers and to find, you know, uh, eventually they sent me to Costa Rica because Costa Rica was a, a, a gambling friendly jurisdiction. And a lot of the people that we were transferring money for, uh, the online gaming sites were there. So they, they wanted to, uh, it was kind of like a sacrificial lamb, you know, they would, they would, they, 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 they would trust us more. So there was somebody they could come and shoot if it went. <laughs> but I, I got to know some very crazy guys and it was, it was people and it was a wonderful experience. And then, um, and so, they were living in Costa Rica. Oh yeah. And I was too. I moved to Costa Rica in 2000 and lived, lived there for about four years. Okay. And, Be- uh, because online gambling was legal there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, okay. It, um, the, the, the short answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, and then uh, and then you asked what I was doing by by the time uh, we were arrested, uh, I really wasn't in uh, a management position anymore. You know, we had grown to the point where Steve and I both recognized that yeah, entrepreneurs. Uh, the the biggest mistake entrepreneurs can make actually is think that because they're good entrepreneurs, they're also good at operating a business. Hmm. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah. There's, prof- there's professionals that go to school for a long time to learn how to do that correctly. And, mm-hmm. and we both appreciated that. So we, you know, f- but we, we brought in some help uh, early. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then, uh, and then you moved up to Malibu when you're not in the operational zone anymore. Uh, I, well, I lived in Costa Rica, but uh, there was, I, 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 I wasn't, I never became quite fluent at Spanish and, or not even close. And so um, I missed the nuance of being able to speak in a language where you could talk on two or three different levels at the same time and have like inside jokes and, you know, all the, I missed, I missed that kind of uh, inter- interaction, you know? And so, and I thought, well, you know, uh, let's have fun, fun, fun till daddy takes the T-bird away. <laughs> 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 That's about the size of it for me. Yeah. And then, and then you bought two places in, in Malibu. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, okay. So take us through, uh, what was going on when the fed, when the feds showed up and were knocking on your door, did you know that there was kind of shady stuff happening? Did you know that the federal government, the U S government would, would probably be looking into something or did this just take you out of the blue? It wasn't exactly out of the blue, Caleb. One of the, uh, it, you know, it was, it was pretty evident to us that, um, uh, well, let me put it this way. We knew there was a barrier to entry. There was a reason why we were the only guys that were running with this one. (laughs) (laughs) But our legal advice was that probably what would happen more likely than anything else would be that, um, you know, they, they, you get a cease and desist order and people would stop and they'd come and threaten you. And, you know, and because everybody was doing what we were, all the MasterCard, you know, FedEx, all of those different money transfer, the banks, all of them were, were doing exactly what we were doing. Uh, okay. But, um, and, and nobody was putting up their hand, you, you know, so we, we, uh, as it turned out, I think uh, the Department of Justice uh, decided, well, you know, uh, we can't, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we can't take on FedEx uh, or, um, or, 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 you know, uh, the bankings, the big banks, but there, here's some Canadians we can drag on the carpet and, and mm-hmm. maybe, you know, maybe grab some good fortress, forfeitures. From them. <laughs> I think it was actually a couple of young lawyers actually who, who, uh, who came up with the idea and uh, they're probably in school together. But and the reason I think that is because the fellow that prosecuted us wound up going to a defense firm. Uh, 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 after that, and into criminal defense, particularly in online gaming, and uh, oh wow, okay. and uh, there's another there's a couple more other other reasons why we think that's what happened. But that's the way these things happen. Young, it's it's actually giving government a bit too much credit to think that they thought of all of this before they moved. <laughs> huh. I, I think some young guys came to them and said this would be a really good idea and forfeitures, and they were right because. You know, after they arrested us, Caleb, and got at the online gaming business, all of a sudden it dawned on them that they should be looking at Wall Street because there was vast forfeitures available for them there. Mm. <laughs> and that all goes into the, you know, the, the vast majority of money that's made in criminal activity in America goes to the government. Mm. Think about that for a minute. 
and it should, I mean, you know, it should, but you know, it's a, um, it's a huge, huge industry. And, uh, you know, in our, in the last 10 or 20 years, while I was involved with uh, your government that way, um, Caleb, I think, uh, I think law enforcement in a way got a little bit distracted by all that money that was available. Yeah. Yeah. And And, and then you're not incentivized to do away with it. You like, you want to keep it going. You just want to penalize it in different spots. Right. It's one of the reasons that it's, it's, it's one of the reasons that drugs or pot is still illegal. I think federally, I think is because, you know, if they pick up a guy on a beef that they've got to actually prove in court, but they also catch some pot on them. Right. Then they don't have to prove the case anymore. They've got them. They can put them mm. in jail for the pot and then start bargaining with them. Mm. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, it is, and I, you know what, it sounds like I should be angry at those guys for corruption of law enforcement sort of, but I'm not, I think my, my thesis is that if there's anybody who gets to be uh, a, a mean bastard in the world, it's law enforcement because they're mm. out there, they're out there, they're out there doing a very, very important job uh, enforcing the, one of the most fundamental uh, I think one of the most fundamental responsibilities of government is to pre- protect individuals from harm by others. Yeah. And that's what, and that's what the, those are, we've lent the police to the authority that they have. Yeah. Primarily for that purpose. So right. I, I have no objection with what they did to me or anybody like me, you know, I, I, we, we were asking for it. We got it. And, and dude, I'm still on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> You know, okay, I, so I paid, the, I paid my the, dues. The 45 days in prison you said was transformative. Uh, talk to us about why that was transformative. Well, because I got to know some guys, you mm. know, mostly. That's what it was. I was, okay, I, when, when, I, when I went in, um, I met a guy named Grady. He was, he, he, and he had one of those tiny little beards like this, you know, and he was a very distinguished seeming kind of fellow. And I, and, and he, he, you know, he's a gentleman to me and I was a gentleman, you know, I was a gentleman, but he turned out to be on my, on my, uh, uh, wing in my wing, there was 96 men. And, um, I'm going to say, uh, 85 of them were black guys and the rest were, you know, Hispanics or Asians or, you know, Italians, mm. <laughs> excuse me. So I was playing chess with um, with uh, Grady one day, and I said, Sam, who was my bunkie, Sam told me that there's no gang guys in here. Uh, Grady goes like this. He crosses his arm. He goes, yo, bunkie? And I go, yeah. He says, he blood. <laughs> as, in, as in the, the gang, the bloods? Yeah. Yeah. And what they do is they separate everybody out. You know, when you go in, they ask you this question. They say, uh, you got any seps? I said, what's a sep? Yeah. Well, if you had any, you'd know. I'll go quick. What it is, is a separation. <laughs> are there anybody in bait? What they're after? Are there, is there anybody that you can't be in jail with? And you can't say I'm blood because that's admitting the crime of racketeering, gangstering, gang, gang, okay. being in a gang. Right. Okay. So what you do say is I can't be in with no crips. And then they put you in the side that's no crips. And so when you're in there, if there's black guys in there that are gangsters, they're blood. Right? Gotcha. If there's Italians, they're either, they're either Gotti or Giancana, but you know, not bad. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so, then there you are, the Canadian. And, and here I am, this, uh, you know, 60-year-old guy, 58-year-old guy with glasses. And, uh, you know, they, they said I they said I look like, you know, look, look at those glasses. You look like uh, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, I'm a teenager. <laughs> so anyways, but it was transformative because... Uh, Caleb, I, I got to meet guys who were looking at, you know, I was looking at 45 days. They say, you know, you can do that standing on your head. Right. But yeah. I was looking, I, you know, I was, I, I was, I was in with a guy who was 26 years old and he was on his second four year bit. Mm. And there were guys in there. There was, when I was, when I was first arrested and shipped off on the con air from Los Angeles towards, I went to Oklahoma city as the hub for con air. And we're in this great big joint in con air where there's like 20,000 people who are flying all around America oh to go to different gosh. prison. I met a guy from Texas who was 18 years into a 40 year bit for, for trafficking marijuana. Oh, wow. He was a white guy. Yeah. 
but 40 years for trafficking marijuana. Wow. There was so 1,600 pounds of it, but. <laughs> 1,600 pounds is substantial. So Con Air is a thing. There's the, because I remember the movie um, mm -hmm. with what's his name, Nick, Nick Cage. Yeah. But they, so they fly in and the hub is in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so you, you're, it's, it's like an air terminal for convicts. That's right. And I, and you have to go to like the, I, I lived in Los Angeles, but the people who brought the charges against me were in the Southern district of Manhattan. So I had to show up in Manhattan for arraignment. They told me that, you know, in the old days, you're lucky it's not the old days. I said, what? And they said, in the old days, they got diesel therapy. I said, what's diesel therapy? They put you in a school bus and they drive you all the way across America and you stop in every two bit town and stay in a little jail cell. It takes a month to go from Los Angeles to New York just to plead wow. guilty. Yeah. Wow. So it's a, no, that, and that's what's transformed. You know, the transformative thing was seeing what it's like um to live on that side of the street Same and to what see it's like in their shoes and to see who's in there you know the guys i met were not the criminals that you see in the movies the guys i met were the basically you know semi innocent losers that got caught yeah, yeah. you know but yeah. they've got the oh, whole all, all hell is served up to those poor guys, you know, 10 mm. years. They get, think of 10 years. Mm. Everybody gets 10 years. Think of that. Ten so years. this was, so this was, um, a, and kind of an awakening of compassion of seeing yeah. that these guys aren't that different than me. And, exactly. and yet they've been dealt this hand. I'm going to be out of here in 45 days. I still have millions in my checking account. And they're going to be here for a long, a long time and being, you know. I didn't feel quite so compassionate towards the guard who was giving me a hard time one day. I said mm -hmm. exactly the same thing to me. He was being, he said, you know, he's being, why are you, I'm a gentleman. Why are you treating me like this? I'm a gentleman. Why do you treat me with respect? You want to show me some respect? You teach, if you want to teach me some respect, show me some respect. That's how you teach people respect. Mm -hmm. He's going, yeah, well, you're in here and I'm not. And I said, you know what? I'm getting out of here and you're not. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating. It was a great experience, a wonderful experience. That's a good line too. Um, okay, let's jump to your book, All's Well. And is is did you write that after getting out of prison? Yes. Yeah, I wrote that in 2016. Pretty, pretty promptly after your prison experience? Is it? Uh, about five years after I started, uh, I started writing a book that was sort of, everybody wanted me to write a, um, everybody wanted me to write a memoir, you know, cause the, 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 the story was so exciting, but I speak about it in the first pages of, of my book, All's Well, Where Thou Art, Earth and Why. Uh, I got very quickly, I got tired of writing sentences to start with I and end with me. I got, <laughs> I, I got somebody else to write that book. We can talk about that one after a while, but uh, All's Well is um, to me, uh, it's a, it's sort of a survey of who, who, we, who and what we are as a species, our place in the universe, both in uh, time and in space, uh, how, how far we've come, uh, how little far we've come also, mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. far we've got to go. One of the thing, one of the things I draw out in it is, you know, the, the, the things that we've learned in the last hundred years since my mom was born. When my mom was born, people didn't know the difference between a galaxy and a star. Mm. And now, when she died, uh, the, the, when she died, you know, the, the, we knew that there were, uh, you know, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, each with several hundred billions of stars in them, and 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 in a multiverse. That we learned that in a hundred years. Now, here's what I challenge you with. If that's what we learned in the last hundred years, what are we going to learn in the next hundred? Yeah. And now let me challenge you this way. That that we're going to learn in the next hundred years is still the smallest part of all we do not know yet. Mm, right. So right. if we were wise, we'd be humble. But we, <laughs> we, we appear to be neither. <laughs> we appear to be neither. That's what, that's what All's Well is about. But it winds up being a book about consciousness. I hope, and, and, and you know the things. It's about the 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 responsibilities of liberty, the responsibilities of of wealth, the responsibilities of authority, the responsibilities of public information, and it's all comes down to we are all the same. It starts mm -hmm. out the epilogue of the book is a rewrite of the uh, Declaration of Independence. 
Really? And it's a rewrite of the Declaration of Independence to state as with respect to every human being. Yeah. Yeah. Not just Americans, everybody, yeah. because we are all equal. And the way in, in the way um, when I say equal, I'm not talking about in our circumstance. Obviously, we're not all equal in our circumstance, but we are all equal in our capacities for uh, to dream our dreaming. Our capacity to dream is the most magical capacity in the universe mm. and our capacity for disappointment. We're exactly the same. The lady in Somalia and you and I are exactly the same. Like I said before, I, I've yet to find a way to distinguish why we should have all of these entitlements and she should not. And she should not. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, with you, John. And I have, um, I, I came to similar realizations. Uh, I think there's something about going through pain, like these disorienting experiences. And mm -hmm. even though it's just 45 days, still 45 days in a federal prison in New York, that's a thing. And for, for me, it was it was 26 years old and going through a divorce when my whole life to that point had been up and to the right. And then now I, I came to the same realization. Oh, man, I'm I uh, I'm, have all these strengths and weaknesses. I'm a mess just like everybody else. And, and that was a pivotal. That pain point was was the first of a number of uh, those pivotal. Uh, pivotal experiences realizing that no i'm connected to everybody else i'm the same as everybody else and uh and that's that's a that's a significant place to get to and even beyond i mean i'm st I'm, a, I'm all for the beautiful country that i live in the freedom that it provides and i'm with you uh that we're all humans where it's about humanity um not just about whatever you know flag you wave so you in addition to that book and that kind of understanding that's beginning to birth in you from your prison experience forward, you started relating to your money differently too. Well, I, yeah. And I was, you know, I grew up a hippie, right? When I was a kid, I was 17 years old. That wasn't the first time, 2007 wasn't the first time I was arrested. I was arrested in 1969 <laughs> for selling LSD to cops that were dressed like hippies. Okay. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, in, in 1969, I was 17 years old, listened to the doors and Jefferson airplane and stuff on the jukebox. And, you know, we had a, there was a, there was something going on there, you know, and it, it was very, and actually, it was a very important something that was going on. But um, the, um, uh, so I was, uh, I knew from a long time before in my life, what was really important about us. And I, and I knew, I knew I was, I was fortunate that when I came into wealth, I already knew that that didn't make me special. If anything, mm. that just made me exceptionally fortunate. Mm. And um, so uh, I, and I, you know, I, um, you believe that from, from the onset. I did. And I, but I also believed that, um, you know, uh, that it was uh, important for me to enjoy it uh just if for nothing else for the sake of all the other people who always dreamed about it but never got a chance to enjoy it yeah. too. so but very quickly i you know you get tired of spending money on yourself you know you've got two houses on malibu beach a jet plane to get there and closets full of stuff that still have price tags on them and it's just not a rush anymore you know mm. unless you you know what do you buy a yacht and then uh you know and then and then it very quickly became evident that the, the only thrill that remained was sharing the thrill with others. So mm. I would take my nieces, you know, on shopping sprees on Rodeo Drive, and they'd wind up with piles that would, well, added up to $30,000, including a grad dress from Armani and you know, from uh, <laughs> Versace, you know, or Prada. And, and Uncle then sharing, John, I get to go out with Uncle John this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was a wonderful thing. And I knew that would be that way. But I also knew, Kate, Caleb, that in the world, that, you know, there, I could give 1500 bucks to somebody and that would be absolutely life changing for them. I mean, and I, it, it happens to me all the time. Now I run into people who say, you know, you, you gave me like $3,000 10 years ago and you saved my daughter's life. I said, what? Mm. And I go, what? And they said, well, she was in Ecuador, you know, and she was, she got in an accident. She needed to be medevaced out to a good, good hospital where we could pay, you know, and yeah. so on. So, so here, here, here's what I think. Here's, here's what, here's what I learned. I think from all of this, the, the dues of being wealthy are generosity. Hmm. The dividends of generosity are gratitude. Hmm. 
And gratitude is the greatest dividend that we can ever receive. It yeah. goes on and on and on. The gratitude is felt long after the giver is gone. Yeah. And, yeah. Right? And, the, and, here, and, here, and here's the magical part. Gratitude um, needs to be expressed. It doesn't need to be, but it can be expressed. It ought to be expressed sometimes. And the best way to express something is to praise it, I think. And you know what they what do they tell us, Caleb, that the um, the, uh, the the most uh, the, the, the the highest form of uh, the highest form of um, of uh, appreciation is uh, imitation. Imitation, yeah, yeah. So the highest form of expression of great gratefulness is to imitate the generosity. Mm. And that becomes a very beautiful magic circle, you know, yeah, it that, does. and that it takes does. us where we want to go. You know, if it takes us, you know, I was, I was knocked out. I was, uh, what's the, the, the lady's name? Tessa, Tessa Graf. You have a very cool mentor there that, yeah. I, that, that I was really knocked out by. She's but, fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, on, and I, I've got this weird thing going on in my, there's, there's her and there's uh, Shay, Shay Leonard, you say Shay. Oh yeah. 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 And she was talking about how, you know, gut, uh, bugs in your gut. You know what it came to me <laughs> when I was listening to these things, generosity is the most critical bug in the gut of our consciousness. Huh? If, if we, if we practice generosity, all the rest comes to us free. And I really yeah. like too that Tessa thought about how important it is to sit and be still and be quiet. And yeah. in her in her in her way of expressing it, it was like it, being still and inviting the Lord to be with you, right? Yeah. And I right. and I'm 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 totally okay with that. I mean, that's a beautiful idea. But I I would like to if I had a chance to speak with Tessa about it one day, I would say, you know, if when you sit like that, if 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 you feel like the Lord isn't with you, who do you think moved? <laughs> who, do you, who, who do you think went away? So in my mind, what we need to do in our, in our culture, what we do is we, we we're busy with stuff and all these things going on in, in and out of our minds all the time. And we, when they come in, they, they distract us and, and we sort of, you know, okay, well, it's, George is coming on Thursday and he's a vegetarian. So we got to sit as a meet and the kids need hockey skates and, oh yeah, the city tax, I haven't paid my, you know, and then I've got, and then I've got that meeting on Thursday morning and I go golfing. Oh, geez, what did I put? Did, you know, and all these things keep coming into our heads, right? Yeah. And we accept them and we deal with them. But I think what we owe ourselves is at least once a day, we should sit down and, and practice uh, what, what I like to call um, the uh, um, skilled management of attention. Yes. And what I mean that by that is uh, consider all of these thoughts that come through our minds for what they really, really are. I, I, I did a, 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 koan, a, a, a haiku about it. May I read it to you quickly? Please. It says, do nothing with thoughts. Thoughts know what to do and may F off anytime. <laughs> so what I want people to do is sit quietly with themselves for, I don't care, half an hour, five minutes, two hours. Yeah, start small, quietly, right? And treat these things that are coming through our minds like, uninvited guests, people who come and knock without phoning first, people who are clients, but don't have an appointment and they expect you to be able to, you know, just like, like, the, no, yeah. just not now. Yeah. And why do you want to do that? Because within us is this spectacularly magical thing. And here's, here's another challenge for you that I don't know if you'll be comfortable with, but I have a hard time distinguishing between what that thing is within us and God. Hmm. Right. But that thing that dreams when we're asleep does not go to sleep when we're awake. It's still there. Right. right. And totally. what I want, what I want us to do is sit quietly, practice skillful attention management with respect to the things <laughs> that are popping through our mind for a little while yeah. and just wait to see what that conscious within us brings. Yeah, and it yeah. always, always brings something super precious. Yeah, it's like falling off a log. It's a drunkard's dream. We only have to sh sit down and shut the shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, John. And I love, I love what you said too um, about if if you sit still and you're not feeling God's presence, who wandered off, right? Because God is. <laughs> 
is all around <laughs> us all the time. And that, re- that relates to your next point of that, of that consciousness or, or whatever. I think of it as soul. I think of, I think of that, that eternal place in me as my soul, uh, given by God that reflects God connects to God in a way uh, that otherwise I can't and getting out of my thoughts, kind of letting them pass as uninvited guests or whatever. I completely agree. That's, that's critical and essential to tapping into that kind of eternal soul that's connected to only this moment uh, and where we find our peace and connection to God. And I agree with you when we don't, it's not God who's wandered off. Uh, it's, it's these, (laughs) it's these thoughts in my attention that are carrying me off somewhere. That's almost the, yeah, I, I was just gonna say that's almost the definition of hubris, right? Yeah, that, you know, if God, you know, if God, if if God's not here, well, you know, come on back, God. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. Revolve around me. <laughs> so Sorry, go ahead. So, so paying attention to those thoughts, do you have that built into like a daily routine for you, or do you just do it kind of all throughout the day whenever you notice your mind going? At every stop sign, and at every go sign. <laughs> mm, yeah, you know we can do it all day long. Yeah, and yeah. there's no reason for us not. The, the the what what we get in touch with when we do that is it's like an infinitely capable um, computing capacity, sort mm. of. Right. Let me say, let me show you this analogy. When I, when I, I think of knowledge and experience, kind of like data and code. And we mm-hmm. identify with our knowledge and experience very profoundly. We think they define us. We think they are us. That's what we are, the, the cumulative of our, of our uh, knowledge and experience. But that's not right. Right. You know, we aren't. Data and code are nothing without computing capacity. Mm. That's what we are. Mm. We are conscious. And that mm. conscious that's within us is exactly the same in every one of us. Mm. It's exactly the same thing. It's a weird, it's a very, very weird thing. But when we grow, you know, when, when, when our species evolved into consciousness, right, we evolved into something that was greater than us and probably exists throughout the universe, Caleb. And when we grew into it, magically, we became one with it. Have you ever heard, do you know, do you know the gospel of Thomas? Have you ever heard about I I know of it. Yes. You know of it? Mm -hmm. Um, Jesus is said to have said these 122 things that a guy named Thomas wrote down. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's been the answer to my prayers my whole life. I've always mm-hmm. been suspicious of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because um, they've been in the hands of the popes for 2,000 years. And those, and those guys have a, an axe to grind, you know. They've mm-hmm. got a business to operate, right? Mm-hmm. But listen to this thing that, that Thomas says Jesus said. Um. If the flesh came into being because of the spirit, that's a marvel. But if the spirit came into being because of the flesh, that is the marvel of marvels. And yet I marvel at how great, how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty. Hmm. So within us is at the very least, the seed of God consciousness. And it's a drunkard's dream. We only have to shut up and do nothing, do sweet F all, and be attentive to what arises from this place in us that at night dreams and see what comes up. The solution to every problem, the solution to every misunderstanding, and they are all free within us virtually, eternally infinitely. Yeah. Uh, that's good, John. And you, you, uh, <laughs> you, I, I, I keep noticing behind you this guitar and is that where you're, is that kind of the, the source that, that, that God connection that all your creativity flows from? Uh, and have you started making music later in life as a result? Cause I know you've dropped at least one album, right? Yeah. There's two of them. There's two double two CDs. 
They're, yeah. and, and they're all, uh, they're, I, I think they're both all up on streaming now. I've just come into the 21st century and put them all up on, <laughs> on streaming. So if you can figure out how to spell my name, you can, you know, go, go listen. I've played music since I was a kid. My mom okay. stuck, stuck me in the St. Mary's Cathedral boys choir. That's when right. I was, That's right. You know, choir. And I, yeah. And I, and I, I, I got a guitar when I was, you know, about 12, my aunt Martha gave me one and, you know, it's Peter, Paul and Mary and Pete Seeger. And then the next thing you know, or there was Bob Dylan and, you know, uh, Neil Young and for, you know, then the sky was the limit. Right. But yeah. I, I grew up in a time when it was a beautiful thing that happened when I was a kid. And that was that as much as men were um, discouraged from speaking about their feelings. Right. Yet if they did it in a song, we put them on a pedestal higher than any other pedestal. So these guys like Bob Dylan and Neil Young and John Lennon, who sang to us about their feelings, we thought of as, you know, the most remarkable men. And we still went out and thought, you know, you know, you don't talk about feelings. You talk about, you know, women and sports and, you know, <laughs> cars. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we have, we, we have, uh, we have tremendous capacity in us beyond women's sports and cars. For sure. For sure. Uh, John, as we, as we wrap up, um, let's, let's circle back to this, um, I appreciate your, your encouragement around being still and practicing that every day. Can you give us a, maybe a, a final thought on generosity and how coming from a man who's had ten, tens, then hundreds, then tens, then, you know, a millions of dollars, uh, how, how would you want just any listener who might be just envious of that kind of wealth, um, what would you want to say to them about generosity today? Well, first of all, the most precious thing that befell me was not the money. Mm. And I, we've already spoken enough about that. The other thing is that generosity, I think, is a very good practice. And it, but it's not a choice and it's not a preference. It's actually a duty. Mm. Being generous is a duty of people who have freedom and that particular benefit that comes from freedom, wealth. And so we should start to practice it and watch the magic that comes of it, even yeah. in the smallest ways. You know, you give some give some kid 50 bucks tip that's trying to make it back to school in the fall and, and see what happens when you run into them in 10 years. Yeah. They know everything about you. Hmm. Let me say this. The greatest gift that we can give is our attention. Yeah. And when you give me your attention, Caleb, that is just the most spectacular thing. Make it, It's very, very precious that you would devote this time to me. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate it. So there you have it. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. I appreciate your time and your attention and uh, the wisdom that you have shared with Shuck. us today. Oh, and, shucks. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll put uh your name to make sure that people can spell it uh and your your book we talked about all's well and where thou art earth and why uh good and with you, money good with money a good rich guy is the next book a rich guy's guide to gaining everything by losing it all <laughs> so good good it's with so money good. My, I got my friend Kerry to help write this one because I was tired of writing sentences to start with I and end with me. But my financial advisors both said to her, he's not good with money. <laughs> 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 so there's the tawdry tale. And if anybody wants to read that, they can read that too. It's all on johnlefave.com. Johnlefave.com. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again, John. It's been a pleasure to get to know you more. I appreciate you being on the podcast. I wish you, uh, I wish you the best in this next season. Uh, I know that you're in, in Canada, uh, on an island, doing your thing, and uh, I, I hope that we can stay in touch. Great pleasure to meet you too, Caleb. Thanks so much for this and all that you do. Okay, I appreciate you. 